Hallelujah. Thank you, Lamb of the Lord Jesus. Would you rest on your feet right now and honor to the word of the Lord? We are in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 9. We take this tradition of standing in honor to the word of the Lord from the priest Ezra. The Bible says that when Ezra had the word read from behind a wooden pulpit, that the people stood as the word of the Lord was read. And so from that tradition, we also stand as we would in our society for any dignitary. When you go into a court, you stand when the judge comes in. So the word is God, and so we stand in honor to the word of the Lord. Can you say amen to that? We're in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9, and we are going to begin at verse 23 and 24. Jeremiah, chapter 9, verse 23, 24. We are grateful for being here with you and the opportunity which the Lord has given to us to Pastor and Sister Pierce. We love and appreciate you both so much. And all of you, the people of God, that are the pastors that are here with us today, thank God for your presence. We appreciate you. Amen. And your families that are here. Amen. Brother Morgan, thank you so much for the use of your vehicle. So kind. Amen. And those that have just been so gracious, so kind to us, and we thank you. I really appreciate the Lord for my loving wife. Amen. And as you can see, she's a warrior and anointed, and you can tell she don't need no soundtracks. Amen. So uh, we are thankful for what the Lord has uh, been doing with us. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Uh, listen to as the prophet begins to speak. You can put it up on the screen. Um, amen. When I quote it, you can just go ahead and put it up. Amen. And listen to what he says. He says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Let's read it all together, verse 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith, so first we're told what not to glory in. Then we're told who to glory in. And what we are to glory in, the prophet tells us, is in knowing God. There is no greater aspiration there is no greater accomplishment on the planet than knowing God. Amen. Would you lift your hands and ask the Lord to speak to you today? Father, we don't need just another sermon. We don't need just something to make us feel good. We don't need a placebo pill. We need for you to minister and speak directly into our very spirit, heart, and mind. We need not just a stir, but we need a change, a transformation from the inside out. And we need you to help us to become more like you. Help us to know you. We thank you for your grace and your kindness your goodness and your mercy unto us. And for this, God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Thank you as you are seated in the wonderful presence of the Lord. I want to simply speak to you on this subject this morning, to know God. To know God. I don't know what blows your mind, but one of the things I've been saved now for about f over 40 years, but one of the things that still blows my mind 
is that God would actually give us access to him. And not only would he give us access to him, but he will actually listen to you and he will talk with you. It blows my mind that the king of glory would actually want to deal with me. You see, maybe you don't understand, there's, there's a lot of people that don't want to deal with you. <laughs> you tried to get anywhere near the president, you're not going to have a chance. Yet the king of kings and the lord of lords will make time to interact with you. Now the sad thing is, we won't make the time to interact with him. But he makes the time to talk to us and to deal with us. The highest thing, the highest goal that can be accomplished is to know God. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, teach me who you are. This begins really in the book of Genesis, and it starts with God creating Adam, Adam. Adam, bara, Adama. Adam is the Hebrew word for Adam. Bara is the word for create. And Adama means the dust. You see, it's a play on words in the Hebrew that Adam was created from the dust of the earth. The dust is Adama, hence Adam. What it means is that God created man from the top soil of the earth, the humus, hence a human being. He created man to be productive and to produce, that man would not simply be one that would receive, but man be one that would produce. But the key was that man was to produce after God's kind. So man was made in God's image. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse 28. Actually, let's start at verse 26. Now, apostolics, we get real scared of this scripture. If it was up to some apostolics, we cut it out of the Bible. But the reason why we're scared of it is because we don't study. That's been our problem. Can I be honest with you? The average Jehovah Witness can eat the breakfast, lunch, and dinner of the average apostolic in the Word of God. You know why? The Jehovah Witness will come and take their Bibles and sit their children down in church and for three hours will have Bible study in church. If a preacher goes longer than 45 minutes, my God, he's long-winded in an apostolic church. Now, we will sit and we will watch movies for two and three hours, but we will not invest this kind of time into the Word of God. And therefore, we really don't know a whole lot about God. It is God's desire that you would know Him. Not just know about Him, but know Him intimately. Listen to what God said. And God said, let us, plural, make man after our own image and after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl over the air and over the cattle and of the beasts of the field and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let us. The Hebrew word Elohim. It is plural. But here's the key. It does not speak of plurality of persons as in a being. Watch this. The Hebrew grammar is similar to the English grammar. When you have a plural noun with a singular verb, it makes the noun singular. The Hebrew word here for create is bara, which is singular. So Elohim creates. And when Elohim creates, Elohim, which is plural, becomes singular because of the singular noun. But notice this. Why is it Elohim? Why is it plural? Because God is taking the multiplicity of himself and downloading it into man. 
all the various attributes of himself he took it and downloaded it into man he's of great quantity man's of small quantity but we're both made of the same stuff so you got hatred from God because God said Jacob have I loved Esau have I Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. You got hatred from God. You got jealousy from God. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. God said, I'm a jealous God. You got love from God. You got laughter from God. All the attributes that you have, you receive them from God. Now sin takes them and perverts them and twists them, but you still got them from God. And why did God do this? It was to set you up to know Him. Do you want to know why you can know Him? Because you are already created to know Him. How can a cell phone pick up waves that you can't even hear? How can a cell phone receive a message from a satellite in space? Do you understand how we got the term cell, cellular? It's because they broke up the earth into patterns and they sent up messages unto the satellite and the satellite sends it back down into sections and your cell phone picks it up, done in seconds. Why can it do it? It's made to do it. How come you can know God? You're created to know God. You say, brother, it's, he's too vast, he's too great to know. Listen, that's why he put within you the ability to open up your mouth and to lift your hands and to worship him. You have the ability to know him if you will apply yourself. Somebody lift your hands a moment and raise your voice. and Oh, I, I want to know him. Uh, it's the highest, highest, highest goal. I've grown up in church. I was a bouncing pew baby. My mother was a very godly, powerful woman, a woman of prayer. Mama would many times get drunk in the spirit. As a child, sometimes she'd be left sleeping on the bench. And they would end up walking out of church and shutting the door and shutting the lights off. And all of a sudden you hear, my baby. And Mama would come back in and get me. But there was something that I learned growing up in church. You can be around God. You can get to the point when you know when to lift your hands. You know all the things to do in church. And yet, you don't know God. There's one thing to go to Bethel. It's another thing to go to El Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. El Bethel is the God of the house of God. And what happens to many of us is you keep coming to Bethel. You come to church, and you experience church, but you don't come to El Bethel. You don't experience the God of the church. And what God began to get across to me, and he had to begin by reprimanding me. He said, I watch you, and I watch the things that you want to do, and I watch you invest time. I watch you that when you want to learn something, you take time to learn it and you invest. I watch you that when you want a friendship, you make efforts and you reach out and you cultivate that friendship. I watch you that when you're into sports, you know the stats and the figures and the statistics on the players. And then I watch you come to me in prayer and tell me the things that you need and tell me the things that you want. But then I watch that you don't even put in half the effort to know me. You want my power. You want my provisions. You want my presence. But you don't want to take the time to cultivate relationship. You want to treat me like Santa Claus. You just want me to come every service and spread out gifts. 
But when is the last time you took a day off of your job and said, I'm just going to shut in to know you? Oh, you'll take a day off and a week off to go and do various things that you want to do. You'll take a day off to catch up with your laundry or housework or do things you want to do. But when's the last time you took a day off and spent time with God? And the Lord began to reprimand me and challenge me and tell me, don't tell me you love me and won't spend time with me. Don't tell me that you love me and will not invest into knowing me. And because you grow up around church, does it make you know God? When I began to understand that, I had to then begin to change my ways. The Lord began to call me into shut-ins. Now, I was raised in the old-time church, and I thank God for it. In the old-time church, we didn't just have all-night prayers. We had shut-ins. Shut-ins meant you started on a Friday night, everybody, including the children. You brought your toiletries. You brought your change of clothing. You brought your sleeping bags, and everybody stayed in church till Sunday. Everyone fasted except for the children. From 12 years of age and under, you fed them, but everybody else fasted and prayed and sought the face of God. We won't do that anymore. We don't have time for that. We want all this power without price. We want all this move of God without investment. And let me tell you, when Sunday morning came, you didn't have to say a hallelujah. You didn't have to tell anybody to lift their hands. God showed up so powerfully in the service. God began to fill people with the Holy Ghost. You didn't have to ask God to do. Because when you sought him, you got his hand. Somebody lift your hands and tell them again, I just want to know you. I just want to know you. Oh, come on, friend. He's not trying to condemn you. He's not trying to make you feel bad. He's just trying to say, come on, come on. Come on and know me. It was from this that he began to deal with me. He said, you want to know me? Take your vacation time and shut in with me. He said, my, keep, my kids won't do this. He said, you want to know me? Shut inside with me. So I got my pastor's permission and brought my changes of clothes and everything, and I shut in the church for five days. Fasted and prayed and studied the rabbinical commentaries in the book of Proverbs and began to seek after God. On the third day of the seeking after God, angels appeared. See, God is no respecter of person. I want to tell you why a lot of times we don't experience certain things, don't see certain things. You won't take the time to know them. Angels started to appear, massive angels. And I began to ask God, what, why are these angels even here? What is, because see, God doesn't let you see angels, or see demons, or see any of this for any reason. It's just not just so you can say, I saw an angel, so you can look all deep and wonderful and spiritual in front of people. Angels show up for purpose. Now, they're always around us, so aren't demons. They're always around us. Angels and demons are always around you. It takes God to open up your eyes to see them. Now, either God opens up your eyes, or you go through the incorrect door, such as drugs. And then drugs opens up your eyes. And that's when you start seeing demons and start seeing things because you went through the wrong spiritual door. When God began to speak to me, he said, your prayers have summons. They are warrior class angels. And these angels were massive, about 10 feet tall. They had muscles, holding up muscles. And they stood at attention, looking straight ahead. They did not move. For the next two days which I prayed, they did not move. They stood there. I slept by them. They did not say anything. They were standing there waiting for their commands. We don't command angels. God does. They were waiting for God to give them their next assignment. Until then, they stood. But 
They taught me something. They taught me that you need to learn how to wait on the Lord until he assigns you to do what he wants you to do. They taught me that you just don't move because you're excited and because you just want to see something and just because you want to experience a move. You must wait till you're authorized to move. The next service came along. I was sitting in the front bench. I could still see those angels. There was a sister behind us, very heavy set black woman, was in the second bench. She had come from New Orleans and she had been taught by her pastor that the Holy Ghost did not exist today. Not for today. And no matter how much scripture we showed her, no how many people she fought, got, saw got filled with the Holy Ghost, it's not for me, it's not for today. I watched as we hit the second song. And can I be honest with you? The service at that point was twice dead and plucked up by, dead by the roots. I mean, it just was dry. But I watched as those angels received assignment. And they moved for the first time. And they went and they stood around this woman and they folded their arms, circling her. And when they did, she immediately started speaking in tongues and slid out of her seat into the front, underneath the front bench, just speaking in tongues. I was confused. I said, wait a minute. Maybe you'll understand what I mean. First Peter chapter 1, verse 12. You'll understand what I mean. Take a look at it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 12. The Bible says this about the angels. That the angels, I'm in the latter portion of the verse, the angels desire to look into this. You understand? Angels don't understand salvation. Why? They've never sinned. So they don't understand what it is to be saved. They desire to look into it. So when I saw the angels participate in salvation, I was confused. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. What I'm trying to tell you is most of us really don't have a clue of what's going on. Because we don't take the time to really invest. We know about cell phones. We know about computers. Because we study this stuff and deal with this stuff for hours upon hours upon hours. But the things of God we are clueless on. And began, this thing began to teach me that I was really clueless on a lot of stuff. I said, Lord, what's happening here? How come these angels did this? He said, did you notice they didn't lay their hands on, him, on her? I said, yes, I did notice that. He said, let me tell you what they did. I said, please teach me. He said, what they did is they blocked the satanic influence on her mind. He said, they didn't give her the Holy Ghost. They blocked the influence of the Satan that was, remember what the Bible says? Look at what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. So you can understand what, what happened. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4. To whom the God, small g, to whom the God of this world has blinded their minds, lest they would see the light of the glorious gospel. So you know what the angels did? They blocked the influence of the God of this world. And even though the service was totally dead, she was falling underneath the bench, speaking in tongues. I tell you, livened up the service then. Speak, pe folks started running, dancing, because everybody knew. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, teach me who you are. You've got to teach me. You've got to teach me, Father. You've got to teach me who you are. You've got to teach me who you are. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, the latter portion of the verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, I'm in the latter portion of the verse. I have watched this growing up in the apostolic church. I see so many people in the same condition which I was in. They know about God. They're familiar with the things of God. But they don't know God. They've been saved 30 and 40 years, have many answered prayers, and yet don't know God. Most of us don't know much of our Bibles. 
You start talking to the average apostolic who's been saved 30 years, and you start asking them about the ashes of the red heifer. Now, how do you understand Jesus as the perfect sacrifice and don't understand the ashes of the red heifer? How do you understand a church service and don't understand the tabernacle of David? Most apostolics can't even begin to explain the tabernacle of David. No clue. Yet in the order of the service of God, music, instruments, drums, all of this was instituted in the tabernacle of David. There was no singing and there was no music in the tabernacle of Moses. David established an orchestra of 288 musicians and singers and instituted that into the order of worship of God. And for you to understand a church service and how it operates, you have to understand the tabernacle of David because it's the law of first reference. The first time anything is used in Scripture sets the foundation for how it's used from there on in. And the reason why we have such trouble with musicians and singers because they're not going after the order of the tabernacle of David. Because David made a law. David made a law. Here was the law. There could be no musician, no singer, unless you're first a Levite. You had to come from the tribe of Levi, or you had no right to sing or play before the Lord. You did not sing and play because you had talent. See, that's our problem. We let people sing and play because they got talent and ability. That, that's not the law of first reference. The law of first reference is you don't play before God or sing to God unless you are a Levite. What does that mean? Well, a Levite meant that you were the ones who assisted in the operation of the tabernacle. The Levites carried. It was out of the tribe of Levi that the priesthood came. So what that meant is the tribe of Levi was extremely knowledgeable in the word of the Lord, first and foremost. So knowledgeable that when the priests were ceremonially unclean during the time of Hezekiah, the Levites took over and prepared the sacrifices. It means first and foremost, musicians and singers must first and foremost know the word of the Lord. Before they hit an instrument, before they open up their mouth, to sing. You must know the word. You must know God. You must know the one you're singing about. And you must know the one you're playing for. Somebody say, Lord, teach me. <sighs> teach me who you are. Give me a hunger. Give me a thirst. Give me a passion. Give me a desire. I need you. Did you see 1 Corinthians 2.16? Look at the latter portion of the verse. The Bible says, for we have the mind of Christ. See, to know God, it means you've got to start thinking like God. To think like God, you have to know the word of God. Can I tell you what happens to most of us? Most of us, we're bored with God. If it's not, woo, 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 something exciting, we're bored. We're going to go to sleep, we're bored. And see, what's happening to most of us, God doesn't thrill you. His hand thrills you. It's not his face that thrills you. It's his hand that thrills you. You are thrilled with his movement. You are thrilled with him saving souls, miracles, signs and wonders and deliverance. But you're not thrilled about him. You're thrilled at what he can give you. You're thrilled at what he can do for you but you're not thrilled with who he is and when you get thrilled with him friend you will get his hand oh yes you will you won't have to worry and you won't just get his hand in a church service you'll get his hand in his everyday living hallelujah hallelujah that's why the prophet told you don't glory don't let the wise man glory in his wisdom don't let the mighty man glory in his might don't let the rich man glory in his riches but if you're going to glory glory in this that you know me and understand me that i am the lord 
Don't glory in the miracles. Don't glory in the power. Glory in the one that's giving the power. Hallelujah. Somebody lift your hands again. Teach me who you are. You're going to have to teach me who you are. I need a hunger to come after you. I need a thirst and a desire to come after you. I need to seek you. I've been going after other things. I've learned about my job and how to work my job and the skill to perform it. I've learned schoolwork and I've passed tests and I've applied myself into so many different things. Now, let me give myself to you. Can I be honest with you? The more I learned about God was the more I recognized I didn't know. The more I started to understand was the more things I recognized I didn't understand. You began to see God for who he is and you began to recognize, my God, sometimes we are just so far from you. Not because you want it that way. Not because you orchestrated that way. But because we won't take the time. Do you know why God sometimes allows you to have problems and trials? Sometimes it's the only time he hears from you. It's when your child is sick. All of a sudden now you've got time to pray. It's when your car doesn't work. It's when you don't have the money for the bills. Now, all of a sudden, you not only have time, but you have passion. But oh, that you will learn to seek him not out of trouble and not out of trial and not out of situation and not out of problems, but that you will learn to seek him out of love. I seek you because I want you. You are the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. You're the hope. Psalm 16, verse 11. Listen to the psalmist. I had to learn. I had to learn that one of the things I had to do was start changing the way I was thinking. Many times going out with groups of preachers, one of the things God began to point out to me, he said, do you ever notice many times when you're out with my pastors, my leaders, they don't want to talk about me. You start talking about God. Oh, brother, let's not be spiritual right now. Let's have some fun. He said, my, pe my leaders don't think like me. He said, because I think I am the epitome of fun. For I will show you the pathways of life. For in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. He is the ultimate fun. Yet you don't want to talk about him. You associate him with, you're just trying to be spiritual, brother. Calm down, brother. We're out of church now. Let's have some fun. You don't know him. You don't know him if you believe that. That's why he's going to raise up a people that aren't just simply going to talk about him, but they're going to know him. They're going to understand that this is what I live for. This is what I have a heartbeat for. I don't have a heartbeat so I can get married or so I can have children or so I can have grandchildren. I have a heartbeat to know him. The reason why there's breath in my body, it's to know him. The reason why I'm on this planet, it's to know him. I'm not here just to have good church. I'm here to know him. Listen to what Jesus said. St. John chapter 17, verse 3. Listen to the way Jesus explained it. St. John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus explains it to us. St. John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus, this is the high priest prayer of Jesus. In fact, traditionally what we call the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6 is really the disciples' prayer. Let me just show you that very quickly. Change with me just a moment to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, so you can see what I'm saying. This, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus says this. After this manner, pray ye. See, 
And then he goes into our Father which art in heaven. See, Jesus doesn't pray. Jesus said, this is the way you pray. This is not the way I pray. The Lord's prayer is not Matthew 6, 9 through 12 or so. That, that, that's our prayer. The Lord's prayer is St. John 17. This is the high priest prayer of Jesus. St. John chapter 17, verse 3. This is what Jesus said. St. John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus said this, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. What is life eternal? The knowledge of God is life eternal. I wonder how much eternal life do you have dwelling within you right now based on the knowledge of God. See, it's based on how much you know him. When you know him, life eternal is within you. Let me tell you something. When you know him, you'll start to become like him. You'll take on his character. You'll take on his nature. When you're like him, you will act like him. When you're like him, nobody's got to tell you to lift your hands. When you're like him, nobody's got to tell you to open up your mouth. Because you know what, my friend? You didn't wait to come to church to lift your hands. You didn't wait to come to church to open up your mouth. But from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. You woke up with a praise. The old saints used to say, I woke up with my mind, stayed on Jesus. Walking and talking with my mind, stayed on him the old saints used to say i'm wrapped up tied up tangled up in jesus wrapped up tied up tangled up in god our problem is you're wrapped up and tied up and tangled up in your problems in your feelings in what you want and in what you desire and not wrapped up tied up tangled up in jesus oh god give us a hug to know who you are. Somebody lift your hands and open up your mouth and tell them I've got to know you. 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 I gotta know you. We were going. We would go on the internet and surf for hours. We won't hardly even read our Bibles outside of church. Most saints don't even bring a Bible to church anymore. I've never seen a day like this. It's like a carpenter showing up without his tools and expecting to get the job done. How do you expect to learn this book? You rely on a screen. And don't you know, understand how God works? That when you open your Bible, the preacher may be looking at one thing, but also the Holy Ghost shows you something else on the other page. But you don't have a Bible to see that. We're wanting so much from God, but we want to give so little. You know, we were, we were look at a restaurant, and my wife read off of the uh, menu, and it said this, that uh, for you to have eggs, breakfast, a chicken has to give an egg. But for you to have breakfast, a pork, a chicken, or a pig must give its life. For you to have salvation, God gave his life. What are you giving? What are you giving? You know what's happening to most of us? You're so busy working for him that you're not taking time to know him. You're so busy with the work of the Lord that you're not taking time with the Lord of the work. You're so busy being his butler and his maid that you never learned to be his wife. And you've associated working with him or working for him with spending time with him and it's not the same thing you can work for somebody and never meet them and that's what's happening to many of us you're working for him but you're not meeting with him 
Do you understand prayer meeting is not just a give me system. Prayer meeting is not just us trying to come together and God give us this and God give us this. The first and foremost purpose of prayer is for you to know God. When you want to know someone, you must spend time talking and listening to them. You want to know God? That's what prayer is. Talking and listening. You must spend time talking to God and listening to God to get to know God. You have to spend quality time with him. Not just in a prayer meeting, but in a lifelong journey. When you're going through your day, talk to them. When you're in your car, talk to them. When you're getting dressed in the morning, talk to them. When you're showering, talk to them. Speak in tongues while in the shower. Hallelujah. When you put on your physical clothes, put on your spiritual clothes. Put on your garment of praise. Put on your robe of righteousness. Put on your helmet of salvation. Put on your breastplate of truth. Put on your shield of faith. Grab your sword of the spirit. Put on on ye men and let your feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and let your loins be girded about with truth get dressed spiritually not just naturally when we get to the point that we know him we will stop having church and we will be the church when you're the church you conduct your own personal services throughout the course of the day. You have your own praise and worship session where you sing to him and you worship him throughout the course of your day. You have your own time of offering where you offer unto him and give to him. You have your own time of word where you study the word and invest time to know God through the word and you have your own altar call where you bring your flesh and you bring your will and you crucify it at an altar. When you amen know him, you will have your own church service so that when you come to church, you don't just start it when the song leader starts it. You can Continue it. Nobody's got to pump you up. Nobody's got to tell you to get excited. Nobody's got to tell you to clap your hands. Nobody's got to tell you to lift your hands. Nobody's got to tell you to open up your mouth. Because if you've experienced him and know him like I know him, you would praise him. You would worship him. You would glorify him. You can't keep your seat and know him. You can't be born in his presence and know him. Somebody lift your hands again and just say, Lord, teach me. Teach me who you are. You're going to have to teach me who you are. I need a fresh hunger. I need a fresh thirst. I need a fresh desire. I don't want to play church. I don't want to try to impress you with spirituality and try to make you just think I'm spiritual and make you think I'm deep and wonderful. My friend, I want it to be for real. I want to know him, and I want him to know me. Uh, the old hymn says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own and the joy that we share. As we tarry there. Let me close with Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Let me close with this. In fact, let me back up to verse 7. Verse 7, if you'd back up to. Thank you. Listen to what Paul said. But what things were gained to me, those that counted loss for Christ. Now, here's the real question. And I want you to catch this. I don't count it loss to gain the ministry. We're in verse 7. We're in verse 7 of Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. I don't count all things lost to win a soul. I want you to catch this. Paul said, I lose everything. I count it all loss to gain Christ. Now, verse 8, listen to Paul. Yea, doubtless I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom 
I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Dung means trash, debris. What are you saying? Well, if you take a carton of milk and you drink it, now the carton is trash to you. It has no value to you. So you don't cry over it. So what he's trying to say is I'm willing to lose everything else in comparison to Jesus because he's the value and everything else is trash. I might not be up on the latest news. I might not be in connection. I might, but if I've got to lose that, I might not be up on Facebook, but I'm, I'm going to have my face in his book. So if I've got to lose Facebook, some of you need to come off. You need to come because you're spending hours on these things, hours. And although you're talking about him sometimes on Facebook, you're still not spending time with him. Verse 10, that I might know him. Paul's telling you what his absolute goal of life is. It's not that I may win souls. It's not that I may preach the gospel. It's not that I may experience a great move of God. But that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I may obtain unto the resurrection of the dead, whatever it takes, whatever the price tag is, if it means he's got to lay me on the flat of my back, if it means he's got to let me lose my job, whatever it takes to know him, Paul said, I'm willing to do it. It's worth it by any means. And did you notice what Paul did? Paul reverses the order. If you back up to verse 10 again, thank you. Paul reverses the order. He said, how do I get to know him? I first must know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul reversed the order because Jesus suffered first, then was resurrected. Paul reversed and said, no, we can't do that. We don't have the power to suffer. We got to get the power of the resurrection from him first to be able to join him in the fellowship of his suffering. The power of the resurrection comes from the Holy Ghost, for the Holy Ghost will quicken your mortal bodies. Quicken means to make alive. So by the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the quickening of the Spirit of God that gives you a hunger, a desire, and a thirst, it makes you so hungry that whatever it takes to get to know him, I'll suffer it. Somebody lift your hands and shout, he's worth it. Do you understand he's worth every tear? He's worth every pain. He's worth every misunderstanding. He's worth the loneliness. He's worth whatever I've got to go through to get next to him. He's worth it. Come on and lift your hands and lift your voice and, and worship him. Rababaha shakababa rashakete. Shakama rashete. Take that from the screen. Nidibabo shakete. Come on. He's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. Shakababa roshakita rabababosha. He's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. Come on, he's not trying to make you feel guilty. He's convicting you, which means, come on. He's trying to tell you, come on, get closer. Come on, I love you. Come on, spend time with me. Don't just get excited when you're in church. Don't just run around when you're in church. Learn to run around your living room. Learn to worship me in your bedroom. Hallelujah. At this time, 
anyone who has been found in the word, I mean, the word has found you, and you find yourself just desiring to be closer to God, to know him, I mean, find yourself either at meal at your seat or find yourself at the altar, amen, this is between you and God, come and just get in his presence, amen, hallelujah, 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 talk to him, hallelujah, let him know how much you love him, how much you want him, how much you desire him, amen, hallelujah, Press, seek his face, seek his face, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. There is none like you, no no one else can touch my heart like you do and i could search for all eternity lord and to find there is none like you Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I know you've already had kind of praise and worship, but um, many times, you know, I like to kind of get into the presence of the Lord as, as well um, before my husband comes forward and he likes to hear me sing. So, <laughs> amen. I don't get to use my soundtracks because he likes me singing a cappella, but amen. <laughs> Amen. But to God be the glory. Once again, I'm just giving God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise just for being so good. And we're thanking God just for being here. Amen. In Wyoming, this is our first time. And we do. We thank God we've had a blessed time in the Lord. We came with great expectations of the things that God was going to do. And God has done some great things in the realm of the Spirit. And it's not over yet. Amen. Our prayer is not just to go places and to have a move of God and have you run, jump, shout, and then as we leave a week later, you're back where you started from. That is not who we are, and that's not what we do. Our prayer is that God will change lives. It will be a life-changing experience. Hallelujah. Because people are looking for real moves of God. Hallelujah. There are real problems, real issues. Hallelujah. And they just don't need just another jumpy service. They don't need just to have a touchy feel of God but they need a real experience, hallelujah, and they need a real life change, amen, that they can move forward in the things of God, and God is calling for change in these days and these hours, why? Because the enemy is not playing, he stepped up his game, and he's meaning to take us out, and we have to get stronger, we have to be wiser, amen, we have to come to know our God for ourselves, hallelujah, that we can stand in the face of the enemy, we always talk about 
about how God is raising up an army. Amen. But when the enemy comes many times, we find us being wounded and, and running. Amen. And God is trying to raise us up. That we'll be strong. Amen. That the enemy will begin to shake and tremble as we stand up in the power and the authority which God has given us. Because even back in the book of Genesis, God gave us authority and dominion over the enemy. And that was before the cross, y'all. Hallelujah. We've had dominion and authority. God has given it to us. We just hadn't learned to use it. And then when he gave us the Holy Ghost, he gave us dunamis power. God's dynamite down on the inside. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he's trying to bring us to places, amen, and help us to grow in him that we will learn how to move and operate, amen, in what he has given us. His spirit is down on the inside. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he's equipped us with power, amen, to defeat the enemy. We just have to learn it and we have to hold on to it and walk in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm thanking God for who he is. Hallelujah. Thanking God for what he is doing in us, through us, and with us. Amen. Because we are just vessels. Amen. But we love God with all our hearts. I thank God. Amen. For Pastor. Amen. Pastor Pierce and First Lady. Thank you all again for the invitation. We don't take it lightly. We thank God even for being in this place. Hallelujah. And I hear some, some ways say, well, the seats are not full. Yes, they are. Hallelujah, because the presence of God is here. And there's angels sitting in the empty seats. Amen. So we don't get, you know, we're not excited about that. We're not worried about not. Because God has here whom he has designed to be here. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. And we thank God for each and every one that is here. Hallelujah. And we bless God. I thank God most of all for the gift that he has given to me, my wonderful husband, man of God. And I thank God for him. I love him. Amen, and I know he loves me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. He is my king, and I am his queen. Hallelujah. Because in order to, you know, you can be a king, but even being a king, you need a queen to walk with him. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and really and truly, my husband was made for me, and I was made for him. It's been years of preparation, but I thank God, because God knows exactly what you need. Exactly what you need. Hallelujah. So I bless the Lord. Um, at this time, I'm just going to sing a little something as God would say and then move out of the way. Amen. But I want you just to s sing with me if you know the song. Just sing a little bit. But really, I want you just to set back and focus your mind and your heart on the Lord. Not that you haven't been already, but let's go a little deeper into his presence. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. 